Welcome to our Monday, Thursday, Good Friday service. Our service narrative for this evening comes to us from Luke chapters 22 and 23 and John 13. Let us open this evening's service in a prayer. Holy God, we come before you tonight acknowledging our sins, our mistakes, and how we have often fallen short of what you would have us to do or how we should have treated others. We pray, Holy God, that during this service, during the foot washing, 
that it will remind us of how we are to serve, how we are to care for, and how we are to love each other, just as Jesus commanded. We pray also, Holy God, that just like Jesus, as God incarnate, called upon the disciples and his followers to stay awake, to be vigilant, that we would be mindful and vigilant and follow through on how and when you call each of us to serve others. And we thank you, God, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, so that in his death, and are receiving him as our personal Lord and Savior, that we would die on the cross of our old ways, being born again into your love and light to this world. Amen. And so what is Maundy Thursday? Maundy Thursday, which is also called Holy Thursday, is the beginning of the three-day celebration of Easter, which is the most important time in the year for the Christians. This period, the Tridum, is one big celebration, remembering the Last Supper, the crucifixion, and the death of Jesus and his resurrection to new life. Monday Thursday commemorates the Last Supper of Jesus Christ with the apostles, his family of choice, and his followers. The washing of their feet by Jesus and other significant activities. The Last Supper. On this day, Christians remember the Last Supper. During the meal, Jesus took bread and wine and shared them with his disciples and those gathered there. Christians continue to share bread and wine or grape juice or whatever they have with them as part of their worship in church. Now, some theologians believe that the Last Supper was also a Passover meal. The meal which Jewish people share together to celebrate the time when God delivered Moses and the people from slavery in Egypt. Other theologians, however, based on calendar calculations, believe that Passover started at sundown, just after Jesus died. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are known as the Synoptic Gospels, because Mark wrote first, and then Matthew and Luke included much of Mark's writings in their Gospels, point to Passover and the Last Supper as being one, while John's Gospel hints at Passover beginning as Jesus died. Now the night of Monday Thursday is the night on which Jesus was betrayed by Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane. The name Monday is derived from the Latin word mandatum, meaning a commandment. Jesus Christ at the Last Supper commanded those gathered there, and now I give you a new commandment to love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And that comes to us from John 13, verse 34. Now the disciples were with Jesus on their journey for approximately three years. Along the way, many others joined the journey. We've been on a journey as well. And while in years gone by we would have began our Lenten season with an Ash Wednesday service, Due to COVID-19 this year, our season of Lent began without an Ash Wednesday service. Yet we continue to be called to a place of repentance, of seeking to be more intimate with Jesus, walking closer with Thee. For most of us, Lent has been a journey of uncertainty as we feel ourselves continuing to be pushed through the rapids of social distancing clinging onto our faith in God like a tree limb hanging over that immense waterfall just ahead, hungering to reach out and touch others, to show social compassion through technology and our actions while remaining safe. For many, especially first responders, healthcare workers, and many other workers such as drugstore, pharmacy, grocery stores, home improvement stores, you have been required to take many risks in an effort to keep most of society safe and healthy while meeting the demands of society. 
All these are considered essential ingredients in maintaining some semblance of normalcy in our otherwise turned upside down lives. And so just as the events at the Last Supper, the Garden of Gethsemane, and Good Friday turned the disciples and all the followers of Jesus upside down. The Plot to Kill Jesus Now the festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was near. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put Jesus to death, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers of the temple police about how he might betray him to them. They were greatly pleased and agreed to give him money. The Preparation of the Passover Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover meal for us, that we may eat. They asked him, Where do you want us to make preparations for it? Listen, he said to them, When you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters, and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Make preparations for us. So they went and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. Let us journey back in time to be with Jesus during Palm Sunday. Remember how we looked at God's steadfast love through the miracles that Jesus performed, including the ones in your own life. The preparations that you have made over this past week in your hearts to prepare for Monday, Thursday, to prepare for Good Friday, and to anticipate the joy of Easter. So while you were sitting here at table, lounging on those thick cushions gathered around a low sitting table filled with the, the meal, as the night begins to deepen, the room takes on a new look. The shadows grow exponentially and you become more and more relaxed. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. Yes, there's a conversation at the table about who 
is the greatest among you. For remember, God has granted each of you special gifts and talents. Jesus speaks to you as a group explaining to you and showing you how to be a true master by first being a servant. Because it is most likely that there was no servant present, the disciples and those present didn't even give it a thought about washing each other's feet. Jesus' washing of the feet is in itself an act of humility by Jesus. Jesus took on the role of servant to help those gathered there that night and us to realize these things, that neither the master or the servant are greater than the other in the eyes of God. For each of us, when doing what God has called us to do, are equal to one another. Just as it says in Acts 10, 34, all are equal in God's sight. And so, also, when Peter says to Jesus to wash all of him, and Jesus' response to Peter is about Peter's salvation, for he has already been made clean spiritually through his salvation by accepting Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. You too are clean because of your salvation. You're receiving Jesus Christ into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior. But because your feet touch the ground, they become unclean and require cleaning. So as I prepare to wash the feet of one here, I encourage you to take a damp towel and to wash your feet, to hear the words spoken and to know that these words are for you. I invite you to reflect on Jesus' washing of your feet. And so, as Jesus knelt before those present one at a time, and he said to each one of them, My child, my Father in heaven has created you as a very special being with special gifts and talents. And he calls you to love your brothers and sisters, to treat each with respect and care, to love each other, and most importantly, to always respect and honor God, and to be a gift to all the people that you come in contact with. And I know that throughout the years you have done just that. And so I commend you holy, for your holiness, for your salvation, and I know that you have a place in heaven. In these things I pray. Amen. Do you find peace in knowing that Jesus washed your feet to show you how to treat one another? Did it make you uncomfortable because you wouldn't do that for others? Does it lead you to a place emotionally and spiritually of seeking to serve others while completing the lowliest of low duties? After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You called me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I am your Lord and teacher, you have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Even now, millennium later, we gather together to remember this act of humility of our Lord and Savior to be reminded 
that we are spiritually clean because of our salvation through Jesus Christ as our Savior, to be reminded that we are called to care for one another, to wash each other's feet. In a word, to treat each other equally with love, honor, and respect. After Jesus returned to the table, he speaks of the pending betrayal and says to the one whom I give this bread will betray me. He gives the bread to Judas. Some of you gathered there did not recognize that Jesus had indicated it would be Judas. You thought because he held the common purse that he was being sent to purchase needed items. After Judas goes out, Jesus speaks of the, the new commandment to love one another that I spoke of earlier from John 13, 34. When, we, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you, as you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved for one another. Jesus reminds you to always love one another, even when it's difficult, even when you feel you've been betrayed, forgotten, tossed away like garbage. Jesus continues teaching, speaking of Peter's pending denial of him, while you, along with the others in the room, squirm a bit. There's a bit of tension in the air. You're not sure why, but... Jesus continues talking to you about how God has provided, is providing, and will provide for your every need. God is always with you, Jesus reminds, even when you deny God. Just as Jesus is sharing about Peter. So when Jesus had finished talking to the disciples gathered there, he reached into the center of the table and he picked up a piece of unleavened bread. He raised it toward heaven, he blessed it, he gave thanks for it, and he broke it. And he said, this bread represents my body, which will be broken for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you eat of this bread, remember me and he passed it among them. And likewise, he reached into the center of the table and he picked up a cup of wine. We believe it was the cup of Elijah, a cup of the very best wine that was put out in anticipation of the coming Messiah. There are others who believe it was the cup of peace, the cup of promise, the cup of joy. We are told that Jesus raised it toward heaven, blessed it, gave thanks for it, and breathed into it with the very same breath that God breathed into Adam. And he said, this cup, this cup of wine represents my blood, which will be shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink of this cup, remember me. Remember the miracles that you have experienced and witnessed. Remember the things that I have taught you. And then 
it too was consumed. And so, at, uh, at this MCC, as at and many MCCs, we include the Lord's Prayer in our communion consecration. And so I just invite you now to join with me in reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so let us now consecrate the elements here and the elements that you have. So, holy God, we just come before you right now, and we just ask that you would make for us this bread and this juice representative of the body and the blood of your Son, Christ Jesus. And that in our consuming it, that we would move closer and more deeply to you. In these things we pray. Amen. So in the name of God the Parent, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit our Advocate, receive now the body and blood of Christ Jesus. You finished the meal. Judas has left, and the teaching moment is now finished. Jesus, you and the others gathered there, stand and travel to the Mount of Olives.
uh, you arrive at the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. It is here that Jesus tells you to remain vigilant as he departs from you to pray and to ask God to take his pending death from him, if it is his will. He returns to find you all sleeping. And how many times have you disregarded what God has told you to do or gone not where the Holy Spirit has led you to go? How many times have you gone and done your own thing, completely forgetting Jesus? And while Jesus is yet talking to you and the others, a crowd appears, including Jesus, as well as soldiers and others. A fight ensues. A slave's ear is cut off. And Jesus rebukes you as a group and heals the slave's ear. As Jesus is dragged off, Peter follows at a distance. And as predicted by Jesus, Peter denies knowing Jesus three times before the cock crows. How many times have each of you denied knowing Jesus in your lives thus far? When you realized, have you reacted like Peter did? Did you weep bitterly? Or did you simply go about your business as if nothing had happened? The Mocking and Beating of Jesus The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, Prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. After his beating and his mocking, you watch as Jesus is taken before the council. They ask him if he is the Son of God. And Jesus responds, you say I am. And they, the council members, convict him. You stand in awe, in silence and disbelief as the council's conviction leads Jesus to stand trial before Pilate, who, upon learning that Jesus is a Galilean, sends him off to Herod. Neither Herod or Pilate find any reason to put Jesus to death. Your heart, it beats faster and faster as you wait for Pilate to pronounce his findings. Jesus is not guilty and therefore no reason to put him to death. To your total disbelief, you hear the religious leaders who you have sought advice from have done as they have said, have believed that they were representing God. Yet these religious leaders, the ones who have led your religious experience thus far, are demanding Jesus' life be exchanged for the life of Barabbas, a known criminal. You cannot believe the shouts that you are hearing. Those same religious leaders are shouting, Crucify! Crucify! Crucify him! Unfortunately, you have seen too many instances of injustice, of false accusations, of out-and-out -out lies. You are beside yourself, and you wonder why God doesn't fix this.
you watch in horror as Jesus is dragged away. People laying a massive, heavy cross on his back, forcing him to carry it along with Simon of Serene. Some are jeering at him, others weeping. Shock and dismay abound in Jesus' followers, you included. You are frozen in time, watching him carrying the cross on which he will be nailed and hung for hours in a slow and painful death. A death which is the ultimate sacrifice to take away the sins of all believers. Two others, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the Skull, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus, treated like a common criminal, nailed to the cross, those nails piercing his hands and feet, the guards drawing lots for his clothes, piercing his sides with a sword, that crown of thorns drawing blood in each and every place that it touches his head as it is forced onto his head. The disrespect that these Roman soldiers are showing your savior. How can they be that cruel? Yet Jesus, hanging there on that cross, and he tells the one criminal, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Your feet, they feel like boulders are chained to them. You cannot move. Mary, Joseph's mother starts to weaken. You move to support her before she falls. You know, Jesus died on that cross to take our sins from us. We as humans find ourselves conflicted in our lives much of the time. We do not understand how God could send his only son to earth to die such a horrible, painful death, nailed on a cross, wearing a crown of thorns. Jesus died on the cross so that we would not have to. Jesus died on the cross as the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus was forced to carry that cross up a hill, to be ridiculed, nailed to the cross, and to die an agonizing death because it was God's plan for all of him and all of humankind. And when we say individually, yes, Lord, I believe you. You are the Son of God. 
I believe you came to die on the cross to take my sins away. And I believe that you died on the cross and rose on the third day and ascended into heaven 40 days later. Because God loves me so much that God sent you as the ultimate sacrifice. And we become a born-again Christian. And when each of us say, yes, Jesus, you are my personal Savior, the one who died to save me from sin, we die to our old ways. And we are born again in Jesus Christ. And while God does not require us to die on a cross like Jesus did, thank God, are we not like the thief who asked Jesus to remember him in the kingdom? At that moment, were we not freed from our sins? Did we not die to our old ways? Do we not, as humans, more times than not, fall short of the glory of God? But I say to you, we have the gift of repentance and of God's grace. An opportunity to kneel before Jesus Christ, to seek a renewing of our call to follow God. We are invited as born-again Christians to die to our old ways, to place our old ways and sins on the cross with Jesus who died to take our sins away. Giving our sins to Jesus, nailing them to the cross with Jesus, releases us from control by those sins. And we are free to follow Jesus where he leads. As I prepare to nail these cards to the cross with the name of you on them, if you have sins that you want to give to Jesus, if you want to dedicate your life to Jesus or rededicate your life to Jesus, whatever God is laying on your heart tonight, I invite you to mentally attach yourself or something that you want to give up to God. And I encourage you to allow yourself to do that as these cards representing each of you are nailed to the cross with Jesus. Yeah.
The Death of Jesus It was now about noon, and the darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light faded and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last.